And now let's turn to our main topic uh, for today, a bit more detail about our speakers. Uh, Dr. Megan Lawson, who will um, go first, uh, is an economist at Headwaters Economic. Headwaters Economic is an independent nonprofit research group that works to improve community development and land management decisions. And in her role, she uses economic and statistical analyses to better understand the issues that communities face, such as economic potential and impacts of housing, land use policies, outdoor recreation, economic diversification, and public land management. She's nationally known for her expertise in measuring the economic and community impacts of outdoor recreation and the potential of recreation activities to support local jobs and, and income. And John Snyder is Washington, is um, the Senior Policy Advisor for Outdoor Recreation Economic Development um, to the Washington State Governor. He manages policy, legislation, budget items, and outreach related to outdoor recreation, tourism, outdoor education, sports, and policy for people biking, walking, rolling. During the pandemic, he developed state guidelines for recreation and gathering as part of the governor's COVID-19 response plan. And um, for example, in 2018, he was one of the founders of the Confluence of States of Bipartisan Effort by States with Outdoor Recreation to Improve Recreation and Conservation Policy. Um, in the past, he also served on the uh, Spokane City Council for several years and owned in regional regional outdoor magazine, among other leadership roles within the public sector. Um, all right, I will now hand over to Megan, uh, who will share her experience and work with us. So stop share, and then you should be able to, to share your screen, Megan. Okay, are you seeing my title slide? Yeah. Okay, super. Um, thank you so much for the intro, Sebastian, and um, including me in this uh, conversation today. I'm really excited to learn from you all and to um, hear your ideas and, and share your expertise. Uh, so we know that uh, climate change is already affecting outdoor recreation and the communities that depend on it. Uh, we've seen really dramatic examples of that this summer already in Yellowstone and Zion and Moab. And during this presentation today, I want to talk about how uh, building an outdoor recreation economy and adapting to climate change can complement each other um, and start to build a positive uh, feedback loop. I want to start with uh, an example from Glendive, Montana which is a small community in Eastern Montana, and it's on the banks of the Yellowstone River. Because Glendive really highlights the kinds of opportunities that are possible when communities start to integrate climate-related planning and outdoor recreation and how both can enhance uh, each other. So Glendive has historically been dependent on oil and gas, and now it's really looking to outdoor recreation to help diversify its economy. And what that means now, um, and how, how that looks now, is that uh, the community needs to build support um, to invest in infrastructure to make that community more resilient to ice jams, which are on the right-hand side of the picture um, and have tremendous potential for really destructive flooding. And at the same time, they also want to improve recreation opportunities um, with these projects. So Glendive is one of more than 100 communities that um, Headwaters Economics partners with on these kinds of topics. Uh, but before I go too much further, I wanna tell you a little bit about Headwaters Economics. Um, Sebastian gave you a little bit of an overview, but just to add some more detail, we are based in Montana, but we work across the whole US. Um, and we believe that all communities should have the opportunity to thrive and to prosper and that the choices that places make are um, around economic development, around land use, are best made when they're well informed. And so our whole mission is to provide independent data and research um, to help inform those community decisions. And we do a lot of work around uh, improving resilience around natural hazards, 
like wildfire and flooding, and also helping communities think about how to weather economic transitions. I'm an economist at Headwaters Economics, and I lead our research on outdoor recreation and public lands. For this presentation today, I'll be in two parts. First, I want to talk a little bit about what an outdoor recreation economy is. Um, and then I want to talk, provide some examples and some thoughts on how communities already are aligning adaptation and outdoor recreation. So this is a roadmap of how we think about an outdoor recreation economy really holistically, uh, because it affects many dimensions of many dimensions uh, in a community and supports the economy both directly and indirectly. And it really starts with tourism, uh, which often gets um, in some places as a four letter word and often gets the greatest emphasis when we're talking about economic development from outdoor recreation. But I wanna emphasize that it doesn't stop there um, because tourism, how we think about it really as a kernel, um, that in a spark that supports all these other aspects of a um, thriving community. We have, it can help to recruit entrepreneurs and a talented workforce, can bring in retirees and their investment income, can support a robust tax base, um, contributes to healthier residents and high quality of life. Uh, it can bring in gear manufacturers who use those outdoor amenities to for uh, research and design and also to help support an authentic brand. Uh, and all of that supports Main Street businesses for residents and visitors. And then we also know that it, uh, outdoor recreation brings in new residents. Uh, and in this presentation, I'll be talking about some high profile communities, uh, you know, like the Moabs and the Jackson Holes that, uh, but I want to emphasize that the phenomena that I'll be talking about are not just uh, isolated in those really high profile, very specialized places. These are things we're seeing in a lot of different communities like Glendive. Um, I also wanna mention that we do have research on all of these different elements, um, but I'm really excited to talk about the connections with climate today. So I'm gonna uh, leave that there as a little teaser and I'm happy to chat with folks more about any of those uh, stops along the roadmap. So I want to shift gears a bit to talk to highlight some community examples of synergies that we see between climate adaptation and outdoor recreation around four things, around economic diversification, around building and deepening revenue streams, uh, around improving public health and well-being, and how to build community support. The first point I want to make regards economic diversification. Uh, so this past summer's floods in Yellowstone, which is in my backyard, uh, highlight some of the challenges that communities face. So we know that towns and businesses do thrive in these gateway communities. That also means they're very dependent on visitors. And the infrastructure, as we can see here, in many of these places wasn't built for today's conditions, let alone future conditions. And outdoor recreation does provide an opportunity for economic diversification, like I hinted at in that roadmap um, that I just showed, but it's not gonna happen on its own. And outdoor recreation economies have a particularly strong incentive to mitigate and adapt because their economy really depends on it. The first community I wanna talk about example is from Whistler, BC, uh, a large ski resort east of Vancouver. Uh, we know tourism related jobs are vulnerable to climate because when the attraction that draws the visitors is somehow affected, whether that's wildfire, uh, snowfall, lack of snow uh, or drought, the people don't come. And during the 2010 Olympics, they had to, this picture, uh, they had to truck in snow, which is obviously uh, not good for a ski resort. But so to protect the recreation economy in this area, Whistler has expanded into activities in other seasons like lift serve mountain biking and hiking, and they've invested heavily in building the infrastructure to support that and to target and market to a new audience. And this has certainly taken time and investment, but
But now Whistler has uh, more money, more revenue coming in during the summer destiny, during the summer season um, than the snow season. Uh, sorry about that. And Whistler really is a great example of a community that has anticipated a need to adapt due to a changing climate and how those adaptation strategies have brought on an even more vibrant and resilient outdoor rec economy. The next community I wanna highlight is in Leavenworth, Leavenworth, Washington in John's home state. Um, it's a small town of about 2,500 residents in the Northern Cascades. And it's styled as a Bavarian village, uh, which you can kind of see in this picture. And it's heavily dependent on tourism. And the city is actively participating in <clears throat> a countywide uh, climate resilience planning effort. And it currently has projects underway around water conservation in light of their reduced snowpack and stream flow that they're already experiencing. And they're also participating in wildfire resilience efforts. And so this is an example in Leavenworth of an outdoor recreation destination that, can, that is acting as a regional leader to support broader efforts. Because again, their economy really depends on it. They also have a richer tax base than other parts of the county to help fund these kinds of projects and to help them be a leader in this because of the money that visitors are bringing into their community. Next, I wanna highlight uh, Minneapolis where they're investing in outdoor recreation, public health and adaptation all at the same time. The city of Minneapolis is partnering with the Parks and Recreation Board and several non profit partners to expand its urban tree canopy by 30%, or that works out to be about 200,000 trees. And that planning will take place on private and public lands. And it's a part of a bigger uh, green Minneapolis climate resilience initiative and that they're funding that through ARPA money. And I wanna highlight this because it shines a light on the opportunities in many communities to leverage projects for the benefits to residents. Because it can be easy to get distracted by projects that really build assets just for visitors um, or initially focus just on visitors, especially when we're talking about outdoor recreation related economic development. But we know that there's extensive public health research uh, documenting the mental and physical health benefits of outdoor recreation um, in parks and trails especially for low income and elderly residents who can be the hardest to reach with typical, uh, more traditional public health interventions. And these are also the folks who often are the most vulnerable to climate impacts. And then the last community I wanna talk about is going back to Glendive, Glendive because I think it highlights another really important alignment between climate resilience, community vitality and outdoor rec. Uh, Outdoor recreation is really popular. And in Eastern Montana and other rural places where population loss is a big concern, outdoor recreation can help to keep, keep residents that they already have and to recruit uh, and bring families back. And so it can help to bring, build broader public support. And public support for flood mitigation grants we know makes them more successful and numerous agencies like the Department of Transportation, FEMA, Corps of Engineers do consider recreation and public health benefits in their evaluation criteria for uh, funding proposals. And there are also recreation specific funding sources. So by incorporating outdoor rec, we can double the, um, double the funding sources. So just to wrap up, um, we know that, I, I'm hoping you remember three things from this. Um, the first is that outdoor recreation economies depend on being able to survive and thrive in the face of natural disasters and a changing climate. And because of that and the revenue coming in from visitors, they really are poised to lead a lot of these efforts. We also know that outdoor recreation can help advance sustainability initiatives by building public support across new groups um, like business leaders, such as in Leavenworth, by expanding the range of benefits to include public health, like in Minneapolis, um, helping to retain population like in Glendive, or expanding the economic benefits throughout the whole year, like in Whistler. 
And then finally, we know that outdoor recreation will happen in places that are that have those assets, um, the parks and the trails um, and places to recreate. But to build an economy that improves a community's resilience does take planning and intention. Uh, so here's just a quick um, plug if you want more data and research on the economics of out outdoor recreation or in our research specifically around uh, natural hazards and equity and economic development. Um, we send out a newsletter, this QR code will get you there. Um, and we send it out about six times a year or so. And that's what I have for today. All right, thank you, Megan. Um, that was really great and very, very interesting. Um, we'll now hand over to John, who will share some more experience about uh, what, what he does with um, at the state level. All right, thanks, uh, Sebastian, Megan. How do I sound? You hear me okay? Thumbs Great. Up. All right, uh, my name's John Snyder. I have a ridiculously long job title. Hopefully it's, uh, everybody on this call has something shorter. I am the Senior Policy Advisor for Outdoor Recreation and Economic Development for Governor Jay Inslee here in the state of Washington. A um, little bit of background on me, you know, I've spent most of my life in the private sector, either working for or owning small businesses. So I guess um, that gives me kind of a healthy impatience with getting things done in the public sphere, and also a natural kind of skepticism of government bureaucracy. Um, but I also have a really, really strong um, uh, value in believing in, in the whole concept of public action for public good. I really feel like that's what we do here uh, at the governor's office. And when you talk about public action for the public good, the biggest challenge for that, for coming together to do things that we can't do on our own is climate change. And that's why my governor, it's the, the main focus, his, his highest priority right now. Um, thought about the word adaptation. In my office, I can't use that word. <laughs> If I go to my governor and I say, hey, this is the, the adaptation stuff we're doing, it, he'll probably throw something at me. Um, and the reason why is to him, it kind of symbolizes um, that we're not taking action anymore, that we've capitulated, that we are just going to adapt to what's going on. Uh, and I'm not sure, I know not everybody sees it that way, but in his mind, this is a fight that's current. This is a fight that we can impact and climate and climate action is what we're about here in the governor's office. Um, uh, Megan had a great presentation on some rundowns of outdoor recreation, and I just want to emphasize that outdoor recreation is big business, not just my state, but also nationally. The Bureau of Economic Analysis about four years ago started tracking a satellite account for outdoor recreation, and I won't bore you with all the numbers, but suffice to say, uh, the discovery there is that outdoor recreation as a sector is as big as, or or bigger than things like mining, uh, pharmaceuticals, and agriculture. So it is a big industry. And I think the other important takeaway from the federal government tracking an outdoor rec satellite account is that this sector is growing faster than the overall economy. And that makes it um, a pretty compelling place to look at policy uh, and keeps my life interesting. In my state, we found that it's $26 billion in annual spending. Um, and almost $2 billion in state and local taxes, uh, and about 260,000 jobs, which as comparison would make it on par with aerospace and information technology, two of the industries that Washington state is really, really well known for. The, the trick is, is that it's harder to, to analyze because these things can range from having a you know, mom and pop lakeside resort to being an industrial designer for REI. Uh, but that makes it about 6% of the jobs in Washington state. So it's a real, really large importance to our state. Um, I, I think when you're talking about outdoor recreation and climate change, one thing that's very fascinating to me is that impacts to outdoor rec are kind of like a leading indicator in my mind for, for, for climate change and climate impacts. Um, I, I, I think that's really clear now. I think over the years, I've had a lot of awkward conversations with folks that have said, well, you know, there's trade-offs, right? You know, if, if everything gets hotter, then maybe we can go to the beach for more, more weeks in a year, right? Or uh, maybe we'll just have to crank up the snow machine a little bit more at the ski resort. 
whoa, uh, I wish it were that easy and that simple. Um, when you get as hot as we are getting now, uh, you have a whole host of problems. So I'm, I'm wondering, is anybody on this call from uh, California? Just wave your hand if you are. Uh, if you are, if you're calling in from California, man, I feel your pain. Uh, Asamu, see a hand raised there. Uh, we were where you are now a year ago, stuck in an awful heat dome. Uh, I live in a pretty temperate coastal town called Tacoma, Washington, which is just south of Seattle. It uh, does not usually get very hot in the summer. We had a reading of 111 degrees at my house. Uh, last year. And it was especially cruel because it was during the longest week of the year at the end of June. So there was just no relief um, until you got later into the night. It doesn't get dark in my town until like 930 in the last week of June. So when you add, when you look at those intense temperatures, um, the impacts are, are just intense. Uh, you can't run, you can't bike, you can't even walk around the block in a lot of places when things are that hot. It really shuts down outdoor recreation. Some other impacts that we experience in our state, when more precipitation falls as rain instead of snow, we are gonna not only have impacts to our winter sports that use snow, but also in the spring Spring and downstream, whitewater paddling, uh, fishing habitat for uh, game fish, all really impacted by not having as much water runoff spread throughout the year that you get when you have precipitation that falls as snow. Um, the, we also have an extended wildfire season. Two thirds of my state, you can't even legally uh, go to a state park and have a campfire in the summer generally with wildfire season is really bad. Not to mention the smoke, not to mention the haze, not to mention the particulates. Um, our coastal parks have some camping loops that we're having to move inland. And um, we even had some, one park where a, a, a tree disease uh, that linked to climate change has rotted the trees so much that we had to close parts of the park for danger of falling trees. Three quick stories about how this is impacting us in Washington. Uh, in central Washington, which is, if you're familiar with Washington, is the more arid desert part of Washington, we have um, a new sports complex that was put together so that kids could play indoor soccer in the winter. They have had to totally pivot to make that also conceptualized as a summer facility, too, because now it is just too hot to play soccer in a lot of cases in the summer in central Washington. Um, I, in the heat dome that we had last year, we had a very unfortunate loss of human life in that uh, heat dome throughout the Northwest. But we also had a loss of shellfish life. It was a shellfish apocalypse. Our south facing beaches in Puget Sound lost by some estimates uh, billions of, of shellfish during that heat event. And for our state, that is a huge recreation activity. Over half a million visits to our shores every year are just for people harvesting shellfish recreationally. And we've had to retool all of our forecasting based on that heat event, which is like nothing we've ever experienced here before. And then also uh, the Quinault tribe, which is on the Washington coast and is a big uh, player in the tourism uh, and tourism on, on, on the Washington coast, they're looking at having to move their entire village, their main village inland at the cost of millions of dollars, just because sea level rise will not allow that village to be inhabited the way it has been for since time immemorial for the Quinault tribe. So these are real world impacts that we're feeling right now. Um, you know, and, and these examples give a lot of, uh, uh, these are also these impacts have a lot of examples of what I would call kind of reactive jobs, right? More firefighting, more construction, maybe more field biology to deal with the shellfish. But when we're talking about climate and climate adaptation, there's a lot of great proactive jobs out there too. Things that are that are being done in Washington State that are going to uh, create great um, employment in the future. And just give you a few examples of that: um, uh, good urban planning. Uh, that includes conservation lands close into where people live and has great climate benefits um, is, is, is another place for, for employment. Um, the electrification of our transportation, including e-bikes. Um, uh, we have uh, one of the top e-bike companies in, in the United States here in Washington state. Uh, we have an initiative 
called Maritime Blue, which is clean energy for um, maritime commerce, but it also includes recreational boating. Um, there's jobs in natural resource management, such as repairing uh, what we call riparian buffer zones. And if you're not familiar with that term, that's like the, the trees and the shade and the shrubs that are on the edge of rivers that provide cooling for fish species to live while they're younger. Um, outdoor school, which we've just made a big investment in Washington State, uh, which will provide STEM education, social emotional learning, uh, and a chance for folks that for kids at a young age to be exposed to careers uh, in the earth sciences and other things having to do with the outdoors that also have climate impacts. Um, recycled materials is another great opportunity. Um, you know, outdoor recreation uses a lot of textiles and a lot of carbon fiber. In Washington state, we have one of the biggest carbon fiber uh, recycling facilities in the country. We're taking things like bikes and also airplane parts and turning them into new, into new products. Um, and then my favorite that I always like to talk about and, and I, 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 I always like to point to is infrastructure for people biking, walking, and rolling. So when you're making trails, when you're doing sidewalks, when you're creating uh, more walkable, uh, more bikeable communities, it's like a triple threat of, uh, of, of solutions. One, it's low carbon transportation and recreation. Now, two, it's public health for the people who participate in it. And three, it creates more traffic to businesses and more jobs to construct than a traditional highway project. So it's pure economic development. And we have a new transportation package that we passed just last year that has our biggest investment ever for active transportation in, in Washington state. So all these things can, can help with economic development and lower carbon emissions. I just wanna say I have a great appreciation for all the work that all of you do. Um, I, I, I think of it, I prefer to think of it not just as adaptation, but as climate action, what you do. And you're taking actions that we all really re need right now because nobody wants to ski in slush or go for a run when it's 111 degrees, right? So thanks for listening and please keep up the great work. All right, thanks, John. Um, great, great talk. Thank you. Um, all right, so before we head into the next part of our session, I have just a couple of follow-up questions to um, you, Megan and John. Um, Megan, for you, you know, you, you presented some of the examples, um, and uh, it sounded like you know it's it's a pretty rosy picture for most places in the future. Um, Wondering, you know, if you could talk a bit more about uh, some of the challenges that come along with, um, you know, being an outdoor recreation destination. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's not all roses um, to be one of these outdoor recreation um, dependent places. Um, you know, some of the challenges that we see around, especially around housing, is really capturing a lot of headlines um, right now. There's also uh, challenges related to infrastructure. Um, you know, how does a community of 5,000 pay for the drinking water and wastewater treatment for 5 million visitors a year? Uh, so those are some of the challenges that, you know, communities are, these outdoor recreation communities are facing. Um, but we know that they're not insurmountable. And I think there's some really nice, uh, connections with, um, I like John's term with climate action, um, you know, especially around infrastructure as a lot of communities are thinking about or needing to upgrade and change um, their capacity, you know, thinking about more, more expansively about different funding sources. Um, and there are a lot of places that are getting really creative around housing as well. Um, and using some different models, carrots and sticks, um, you know, incentives for builders, regulations um, in communities to try to tackle some of those challenges. Okay, and, and you talked, you just mentioned funding sources or funding. Um, what are um, some- Hey, Sebastian, related? do you mind if I take a stab at that question too? Yeah, go I'm for sorry. it. 
I, I, I and Megan did an awesome job of talking about, about it and also from the perspective of the small communities. I would say I'm thinking about it a lot from our big urban areas as well. So if you live in central Seattle and you don't have safe streets so that your grandma can walk around the block safely and that's her recreation, you know, there's there's a problem there. And there's a challenge with taking a hundred or two hundred year old city and retrofitting it so that it has just the basic easiest type of recreation, which in my mind will always be walking and or biking um, and making it safe. So in, in, a, in a large city, the, it, it, I, I echo everything that Megan said about housing, where it's not just in the destination communities, those small towns and beautiful places, it's also in our big cities. And it's also connected to urban planning. We've, we've taken a, you know, a 30 year nap on building the kind of housing that we need. And we've protected too much with zoning um, and making housing illegal. My, my governor is working very hard to get the missing middle back in Washington state, because none of this matters if you can't live near housing, uh, live, near, live near good outdoor recreation. Sprawl kills outdoor recreation. It makes it harder for people to get to it, and it gets it develops the 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 natural landscapes that people love to do it in. Um, yeah, just one one follow up question, and you know, um, Megan, you mentioned funding sources. What are some of the funding sources you are aware of? And maybe John, you can you know talk about that as well, based on what your experience in, in Washington. So I always tell people who come to me wanting to do outdoor recreation things is that it, there's no, there's not a funding problem, there's a priority problem, right? We have a lot of money in this country. We have a lot of money in my state. We are spending it on, on, on certain things. And if, if you can't come to the table and show that outdoor recreation is a solution to certain problems, it's hard for you to compete against other funding sources. There, you know, there's lots of different grant programs out there and there's lots of creative ways to thread the needle to get something done. But at its core, you need the political will. And so that's the, that's the key ingredient in, in, in funding in my mind. Yeah, I definitely echo what, what John says. And um, you know, just, Absolutely, around prioritization and you know some specific um, federal programs that have been really helpful with building those connections um, is the federal lands access program, the FLAP grants um, that help communities to make those connections, um, build that active transportation network to get folks out to uh, outdoor recreation areas. Uh, there's also for kind of the folks on this call who work in more rural areas, uh, EPA's uh, Recreation Economies for Rural Communities program um, is a great capacity building program for those places that are looking to build an outdoor rec um, focused economy. Now I wanted to open it up pretty much to all of you ask some more questions uh, or comments you have. Um, I received one, and we'll start with that one in the chat um, from David Glass, and it's, it's directed to you, Megan. Megan, as an economist, what is your take on the increased outdoor recreation as a result of the U.S. economy's shift further toward more services rather than goods as opposed to other trends? Um, I'm not entirely sure what exactly David was getting at, but you know, some thoughts on that. Um, you know, I think outdoor rec is one of the benefits of outdoor recreation as a sector, um, really is the fact that it does contribute to the economy, both in terms of goods and in services. Um, you know, the manufacturing component of outdoor rec is, really underappreciated and um, it, shockingly big, um, you know, especially in different parts of the country that are real manufacturing hubs. Um, you know, it's, it's really powerful. Um, but at the same time, you know, thinking about services um, and, you know, that bigger shift more towards services, um, there are, you know, thinking about guiding services um, and those kinds of things that's also supported by, um, those outdoor recreation economies. 
but I'm not sure, David, I don't know if that exact, if that really quite answers your question. So if you want to chat with me or follow up later, um, you know, I'm happy to talk more. Um, and may, that's maybe Megan and John, you can speak to it, but, uh, you know, for, for many communities uh, of color or minor, minorities, nature or recreation, um, outdoor experience is rare or non-existent um, due to many reasons like, you know, accessibility or resources. Um, and so I'm wondering if uh, Washington State or from what you her, um, said, Megan, uh, from your experience, um, you know, these adaptation ac activities um, or resiliency activities, could they, could they provide or are they providing an opportunity to uh, for more inclusivity or uh, diversification to include those groups? Um, I could take a first crack at that, um, you know, and I'm sure John has some thoughts too. Um, but, you know, I think a, like the Minneapolis example, I think is a, is a perfect one where um, they are targeting a lot of these tree planting uh, investments in um, marginalized communities in the area uh, to try to address some of those facts that, uh, or address those impacts um, that are felt more heavily in these lower income or marginalized places. So, yeah, I would say for me, part of my job is um, staff is uh, recruiting folks for our various boards and commissions. We're a very horizontal state here in Washington state. So we have our parks, uh, Department Parks Department is, is governed by a volunteer board. Um, our Fish and Wildlife Commission volunteer uh, volunteer board as well. I try to re recruit diverse voices in those leadership positions because that is there's only so much I can do about projecting what the needs are of, of diverse communities and communities of color. We need to get folks in those positions that, that um, represent the populations of our state and have the direct experience that they can offer. I would say the other thing that's going on in Washington is there's a big discussion now about environmental justice and how it um, impacts um, um, communities of color. We have a whole task force on that. We're doing a lot of work on that, but sometimes it only gets defined as in the negative. So we're trying to protect communities that have been historically kind of afflicted with these terrible environmental justice situations and trying to prevent that in the future and remediate what's been done in the past. But I also look at from the other perspective too is I, I, those same populations need to have the exposure to the positive things in outdoor recreation and in our natural landscapes too. I wanna to make sure they have access to a park maybe within 10 minutes of their house, the ability to um, have the time and, and wherewithal to go to some of our state parks or national parks. So it's, it's I look at environmental justice kind of from both sides, preventing negative impacts, but also making sure that we get the positive impacts too. Thanks, John. Um, are there any other comments or questions, um, things you want to share based, based on your, your experience and your work? Um, now, now is the time. Yeah, um, hi. I was uh, wondering if there are similar to the uh, question that was asked earlier about um, access to recreational for environmental justice communities or uh, folks who have um, potentially lower access to uh, outdoor recreation. I was wondering what um, from a municipal government perspectives um, might be the investments that are made for um, say urban cooling, um, you know, to mitigate urban heat uh, or even um, invest in regional uh, green infrastructure uh, strategies for flood mitigation, et cetera. Um, if both of you could talk about that, um, both in Washington and elsewhere. S 
So I guess I'll, I'll say that um, some of the things that are going on in Washington State, we have a program called, you mentioned floodplains, we have a program called Floodplains by Design, and it has a strong outside stakeholder partner in the Nature Conservancy that has worked with our state to try to look at how um, our floodplains are impacted by development and how to make them work best for both the environment and also the people living in those areas. Uh, real complicated tough work, but important work and one infected by climate change and also impacts outdoor recreation. And then our Department of Natural Resources has a pretty robust urban uh, uh, forest canopy initiative. And some of our individual cities do as well. have been hiring arborists, have been hiring, um, uh, you know, Look, putting putting in resources into their urban treescape, um, including offering free trees to folks and and taking better care of the trees that the public sphere manages. But it's a it's a big issue. I mean, there it, it, and it's not solved easy, as you know, because you can't when when a tree comes down, you know, to get shade covered tree, you know, you're waiting 30, 40, 50 years for it to be at maturity. So I think in my mind, one of the primary things we need to do is is look at our development and and not take down the trees that we can avoid taking down. Sorry. Um, yeah, all I'd add to John's um, point is just that there is a lot of opportunity to consider, you know, where development is happening and which places, um, you know, are being revitalized um, and and being developed and considering where um, green infrastructure, especially, can incorporate outdoor recreation um, as assets to these communities. Uh, just to make sure that those are are already part of the uh, part of the fabric of these places. So, Sebastian, I see a question in the chat from Asamu about. Um, uh, he says, one thing I've noticed is a challenge is the cost of local governments and other stewards maintaining recreational areas, especially as they become more popular. Does anyone have any examples of strategies or successes in that area? And I guess the thing I would point to is friends groups. So in Washington State, we have the Washington State Parks Foundation, which is a private nonprofit, which it raises money for and also does planning and support work for state parks. One of their functions is they lead a network of friends groups. So we have every, most of our popular parks have a friends of the park or a friends of the trail and they give them support um, and help them with best practices and know-how so they can get volunteer um, efforts and, and volunteer donations to help support parks. So there's a little bit of a, a public private aspect to them. And that's been pretty successful in our state. I see young bro, um, you're raising your hand. Um... Yes, to um, expand on that, because uh, that has actually been a recurring topic of discussion within the ASAP funding and the finance group that uh, like to bring up um, one concept, um, I, I'll post it in the ASAP Slack uh, once I located, but not too long ago encountered a concept that was actually uh, recommending that uh, you ex greatly expand the definition of what a uh, land trust is to encompass all um, rural lands, at least uh, as wide a scope as possible, and a way to maintain see, those amenities that keep those areas uh, rural, whether it's to support infrastructure and whatnot, is to actually set up a uh, value capture mechanism so that those who build say more housing in areas already with good transit and uh, this is for california but washington state can equally benefit from this that if you build housing additional housing areas with transit you actually get density bonuses that part of which would then go to support uh, investment that means because otherwise it would be straw otherwise. So by preserving that land, by keeping that land rural instead of allowing it to develop, um, that would be a way of ensuring enough, uh, not only the fiscal support, but also uh, preserving uh, while enabling a greater supply of uh, housing in areas where there's great demand. Thanks, Jim. 
Sorry, go, go ahead. It seems like you no, had. I just going to say that, that's a really good point. Um, we have real estate excise tax that can be used for local parks in our state. Um, the, you know, I, I was speaking with somebody who was from the Netherlands recently and talking about their kind of their bicycle miracle over there in the last 50 years. And he sent it to me in a way that I'd never heard it before. He said, you know, we had to figure out how to do this because we don't have enough room enough land mass for everybody to own a car it's just a it's a math problem for them our problem in the western united states is we kind of have too much land so it takes an enormous amount of political will to do the kind of things that you describe which is you know keep the the farmland rural and not sprawl out with bad and planned development. There's some good examples of doing it, but it's a struggle and it will continue to be. Uh, I noticed that there's a bunch of awesome questions that have just flooded the chat right as we're about to end here, including one about tribes and and uh, and, and their uh, parts and, and outdoor recreation. Big thing for us in Washington state, we have 30 recognized tribes here and some unrecognized tribes and something I, I'd, I'd be happy to follow up off offline. Thanks, John. Yeah, you're right at five. Um, we have a few more questions, but I'm going to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, thank you very much, um, John and Megan. It was great to ha have you on our, on our call. And our session today was very informative, really interesting. I learned a lot. I really, really appreciate it. Well, yeah. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah. Thank you.